Hi there, this is David and welcome to the five things that I wish that I knew before I started playing Live Alive. I've now played this game multiple times and it's not like every other JRPG that you've played before. It really does have quite the learning curve. And again, it's an odd one. So I'm here to guide you along and help you not make the same mistakes that I did whenever I first played the game. Also, this video is applicable to both the SNES and the newly remastered versions. So, let's go ahead and jump right on in. Number 1. Explore Everything Not all chapters are created equally. In some of them, you can really move around and explore freely to find all sorts of stuff. Other chapters can find you to one area with limited exploration, while others literally just let you point, click, and battle. So with that being said, I would highly recommend that you explore every nook and cranny in only two out of the chapters, Pogo's and Aboro's chapters. In the prehistoric era, you can create powerful weapons and accessories through the crafting system, and you can fight a hidden super boss towards the end. Even more importantly, in Edo, Japan, where Boro can come across his own set of super bosses, ultimate equipment, and then, if you don't kill any women, the incredibly useful medicine box, which is a healing item that you can use as many times as you want, and, importantly, you can bring this with you to the final chapter, but only if you have it equipped on Aboro as an accessory, which go ahead and brings us to number two. Only what you have equipped will go with you to the final chapter. While you should obviously poke around to get enough items and equipment to finish each chapter, don't obsess over it, because everything in your inventory will vanish whenever you get to the final chapter. That is, except for the clothes on your back. Thankfully though, things that you would never expect to equip can actually be thrown into your five different accessory slots. For example, in Akira's chapter, you can find robot parts, and although he's not a robot and can't use them, you can put them on him and then later give them to Cube whenever you meet up with him in the final area. Also, Pogo's scenario allows you to craft all sorts of good accessories, many of which multiple characters can use. And finally, in Oboro's chapter, the previously mentioned medicine box can be equipped as an accessory, so you can transfer it over to the final chapter. Number 3. Experience and gold don't really matter. Do not come in to live alive expecting this to be just like any other SNES era JRPG from Square, because this one is experimental, even on down to the experience and gold system, because there is no gold. In fact, you won't be buying or selling anything in the entire game. Everything that you'll get will be from treasures, drops, and crafting. Experience is reworked as well, and it uses a Suikoden style system which pretty much makes overleveling impossible. Instead of focusing on that, just focus on the items. Except, of course, in the final chapter, where you're pretty much forced to grind from level 10 to like 16 before you really have a snowball's chance in hell to defeat the final boss. Number 4. Turn Enemies Around A lot of battles can be downright unfair, leaving you outnumbered and outgunned with little that you can do about it especially if you don't have positioning figured out. However, one thing that can really turn the tide in your favor is turning an enemy around, especially the bosses. If an enemy turns you around, it's no big deal. You can still hit them without wasting your turn. But if you turn the enemy around, it essentially skips their next turn, giving you a free chance to get a hit in. So if you're underleveled or outgunned, Sometimes the best strategy is to turn them around, hit them, then rinse, and repeat. Number 5. Choose Sundown After you beat the first 7 scenarios, you're going to be pulled into an 8th chapter. Then, after that, you'll be told to choose a party leader for the final chapter. While some of the characters do bring along their unique abilities such as fast movement speed or mind reading, that pales in comparison to what Sundown brings to the table. Just picking him saves you the most precious thing, time. In the final chapter, when you go about recruiting everybody else, 
you just kind of walk up to them, talk to them, maybe have a fight, and then they'll join up. But not with Sundown. You don't just have to meet him once, but you meet with him nine whole times in nine different places. It's so annoying. Also, choosing Sundown will allow you to skip the fight with Masaru because, as they say, you don't bring a gun to a fist fight. But not only that, Sundown is arguably the most useful of those characters because once he gets level 16, he can pretty much just win the game by himself. Well, that's it for the five things that I wish that I knew before I started Live Alive. What are your best tips? Let me know in the comments. And if you like this video and what I do here on the channel, please consider supporting me over on Patreon for exclusive videos and early access to my content, heading on over to Twitch for some streaming fun, or coming over to my Discord to chat and hang out. The links to them all can be found in the video description. This has been David. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good day.